Hello, BookTube. Well, we come to the end of it at last. <laughs> this is the end of Hitch Along 2019, a read-along that I've been doing with David Murphy, where we take Christopher Hitchens' book, God is Not Great, and read chapter by chapter on every weekday until we're done. <laughs> we are now done. We are now at the conclusion, chapter 18, which is called The Need for a New Enlightenment. Uh, and the, we, David and I have been pretty rough on this book, pretty rough on Hitchens' cutting corners, his dirty pool, his sloppiness, his laziness. His, the obvious times throughout the book where he is bringing up a subject that he himself has not bothered to comprehend completely. All sorts of criticisms like that. Uh, and even from the beginning, even before we made these videos, people were asking me, I'm sure they were asking David, why are you bothering? Why are you bothering with this particular book? When you know ahead of time that there are better, for instance, atheist screeds, anti-religion screeds out there than this thing. And one of the big reasons, I think, was that uh, we both wanted to acknowledge the sway that this has, the cachet that Hitchens has as a figure, a huge amount of YouTube in its current format, a huge number of channels, a huge number of very successful people uh, were born by going down Christopher Hitchens' rabbit holes on YouTube, by, by just overdosing on Christopher Hitchens. Uh, I believe myself, I, I, haven't, I haven't talked about this uh, with David, but I believe that a huge amount of what we now term the alt-right was born of, of Christopher Hitchens' rabbit holes, of either understanding or misunderstanding a lot of the stuff that Hitchens says and writes. Uh, and that cultural cachet was a part of the reason why we went through this in such, in such excruciating detail. And we are now down to the final chapter, in which Hitchens says that we need a new enlightenment. And as you're going to see coming, he does not flesh out that argument. He, he barely even bothers to make it. This is just more, a, a little more... Uh, random flailing before the end of his book. Uh, and at the heart of it is his objection to religion just in general, that it, that it has outlived any usefulness that it once has. He writes, religion has run out of justifications. Thanks to the telescope and the microscope, it no longer offers an explanation of anything important. Where once it used to be able, by its total command of a worldview, to prevent the emergence of rivals, it can now only impede and retard or try to turn back the measurable advances that we have made. Sometimes, true, it will artfully concede them. But this, this is too often itself the choice between irrelevance and obstruction, impotence or outright reaction. And given this choice, it is programmed to select the worst, the worst of the two. Meanwhile, confronted with, an, with undreamed of vistas inside our own evolving cortex and in the farther reaches of the unknown universe and in the proteins and acids which constitute our nature, religion offers either annihilation in the name of God or else the false promise that if we take a knife to our foreskins or pray in the right direction or ingest pieces of wafer, we shall be saved. It is as if someone offered a delicious and fragrant out-of-season fruit, matured in painstaking and lovingly designed hothouse, should throw away the flesh on the pulp and gnaw moodily on the pit. And uh, <laughs> that, I think, uh, I mean, it, I'm sure that Hitchens didn't intend it, but that passage, to me, typifies a huge amount of this book. Not only the good, but the bad. The good, of course, is that is eloquently written. It's memorably eloquently written. That's, I think, that part of the reason for the cachet of this book is that so much of it is memorably done. There's so much rhetorical ability on display here, even when it's prodigal or wasted. And the, it also evinces the bad part, the number one bad part about God is not great, which is the subtitle is How Religion Poisons Everything, is evinced in that passage in that Hitchens doesn't understand religion. Now, maybe that was inevitable. It, it seems to me that he's probably been, he was probably an atheist for most of his life, from probably from his teenage years on. Uh, but you could have tried a little harder. <laughs> if you're going to write a book about religion and its allures, you could have tried a little harder. Most of the people, most of the religious... this, baby? <laughs> most of the religious people that I know and have known in my life are not all about the wafer or the foreskin <laughs> or pointing in the right direction to, play, to pray. And most of the religious people that I know in my life and have known in my life aren't all that concerned about the fact that religion once offered a work in cosmology, and it doesn't anymore, that actual cosmology has taken its place. I don't know, for instance, anybody, I have never known anybody in my life who was genuinely religious. I've had, I've had the great honor to know a lot of genuinely religious people in a few religions. I have never known any one of them 
whose religious faith even wobbled a bit, much less was defeated, by their scientific education. <laughs> Quite a few of them, of religious people that I know, are scientists. It doesn't have any effect on their faith whatsoever. And if you were to ask them, they wouldn't even recognize their faith in the description that Hitchens gives there. They would say, no, religion has always been good at some things and uh, bad at other things. And the things that it's always been good at are the things that it's good at now, today, for me, knowing perfectly well about x-rays and uh, cosmic background radiation and the theory of natural selection. Knowing all those things and accepting them perfectly fine, religion is still good for me for those things. That is something that either Hitchens never understood or adamantly refused to admit into the ambit of this book. And it, it of course, is a huge weakness of the book. Is it, that any, it, Not only is it a weakness of the book when you read it sympathetically, where you're reading it along sympathetically, as I try to do, and thinking, okay, well, I love you, Hitch, but God Almighty, was that chapter bad? Or God Almighty, was that argument poor? You, I, there's an argument to be made here. There's a history to be written here, and you're not doing it. And you easily could. <sighs> Uh, it's not only that, that, that even with the best of intentions you go through here and you see faults and flaws everywhere, it's also that those faults and flaws give your enemies a cudgel to beat you with. The, the enemy in this book is mindless fundamentalist religion of any kind. Mindless fundamentalist religion that that does what that passage says. It retards the advancement of science, that retards the advancement of civil rights or basic humanistic values in favor of a dark, religious, primeval age in which hearts are ripped from living chests. Uh, the enemy of this book is those people, mindless, bigoted fundamentalists who are with us still in great numbers. Uh, I maintain that the world would look completely different if they were the majority of religious people. I think the majority of religious people use it in all the ways that it should be used, but that's unprovable in one way or another. In addition to doing a bad job, Hitchens does a useful job for those mindless religious fanatics. They can take this book and use it as a weapon. And that was irresponsible. For someone who should have, who should have been able to write the knockdown rhetorical uh, case, that was irresponsible. But in, con in the conclusion of the read-along of this book, we can, I can at least say this is not the knockdown case that all of its fans think it is. This is not the knockdown case that Hitchens thought it was. He basically memorized this book and then repeated chunks of it verbatim on his little book tour that he did all throughout the country. And those speaking engagements sold out and uh, people waiting outside. There were people sitting in the aisles and there were people who waited all morning, all day, to get a ticket to listen to Christopher Hitchens recite from this thing, even though I believe Christopher Hitchens reads the audiobook. You could have saved yourself the trouble and just bought the audiobook. Uh, and then when they would get to those events, quite often they would be dealing with a drunk, Christopher Hitchens, who was, yes, repeating chunks of this book verbatim, but he was repeating them while being shouted down by the other people in this alleged debate. How many times? Did Hitchens go to a debate, start drinking before the debate started, and then he gets, he's got a 10 minute opening slot, he gets to minute 9.5 of that opening slot, and that's when he launches into one of the, one of the gigantic chunks from this book, and anybody who'd read the book knew that it was going to take him at least five minutes to do, and it should, you'd just be, you'd have, the moderator would just be saying, time, 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 and he'd just be, he'd just keep going, and the audience loved it, they ate it up. I don't know how many of those those uh, ignoble moments are caught on YouTube, are part of a Christopher Hitchens rabbit hole, but rabbit holes come and go. <laughs> this book is the book he had a chance to write. He's not here to correct it. He's not here to write another book. This was his chance to write his great book, his great screed against organized religion. And it's effective in parts, scattered here and there, but it is mostly... Uh, a sloppy, bombastic mess. <laughs> and that that is uh, my own verdict on God is not great. Now that we're at the end of our read-along, I don't know what David's verdict will be. I suspect it won't be any more charitable than mine, but we had not, are not conferring for this read-along in any way. So I don't know what he's going to do in his videos until he does it. Uh, but I should say we weren't conferring until just the other day when I guess it dawned on him in his post-Wisconsin State Fair stupor that our read-along was coming to an end, and he Skyped me, and his voice was quavering, and I could tell 
book two that he'd been crying. And he said, oh man, I don't know if I can do without you. We're going to end with our, we're going to end our read along. And then what happens? We don't, don't have a read along anymore. No, man, we got to get the band back together. So we put our heads together and we thought, why did we pick this book? Why did we decide to give it so much attention? Well, it's because I mentioned because of its cultural cachet. In other words, because it is a nonfiction dude bro book. It's it's the dude bros. You go to their college room or whatever, you will see the six books that they have on their little shelf, and this will be one of them. They think that Hitchens is the man. They they are fonder of their fiction, dude bro fiction, Cormac McCarthy all the way back to Ernest Hemingway. They're fonder of that. That makes them feel Chuck Palahniuk. They love that sort of crap. Uh, but there are there are a select number of dude bro nonfiction works, and I didn't like to see David cry. I didn't like to see him get all choked up. And you're probably wondering what our next read-along will be. <laughs> we decided. Now that we've... Uh, well, I say we. It was mostly me. <laughs> In fact, he might not even know about this. <laughs> What's the matter, baby? You want to jump down? Hmm? What's the matter? Oh, you're so pretty. You're so pretty. You want to jump down? There you go. Uh... So you're wondering what our next read-along will be? Surely you can guess. On that little dude bro shelf of nonfiction, what's the number one book? What's the number one book that has been calling out for a chapter-by-chapter read-along? Yes, indeed. It's The Twelve Rules for Living. It's Jordan Peterson. <laughs> so, I'm thinking that should be David and Mai's next read-along. Chapter-by-chapter. Jordan Peterson. I'll, uh, I'll let him know. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, too.